Greetings comrades! Those who have been watching my channel for a long time have noticed that I try to mix two different topics. Videos about Soviet things alternate with videos about life in modern Russia. And I would like to focus on some recent relevant events from the life of Russia, but you see, what exactly should I talk about? I am not ready to risk talking about Roscosmos and its successes now because of the FSB recommendations from 2021, about the internal political life of Russia. Well, we could certainly discuss which of the six Evgeny Prigozhin's doppelgangers was on the airplane, but about some other important event of the last two years, certainly not. But finally, something happened in the political life of the country and the world that I want to discuss and that I can discuss without being paranoid and without the need for rigid self-censorship. BRICS has expanded. Or is it BRICS ICU? ICE Airbuses? Let's talk about it, and first of all about what this organization and its expansion means for Russia. In Johannesburg, where they decided to expand their membership from 5 to 11. First of all, I don't know whether it is necessary to say this, but in case someone doesn't know at all what BRICS is. BRICS is an interstate association of four, then five and now eleven large states, which are commonly referred to as developing countries. Contrary to popular belief, BRICS is not China's answer to NATO, and it's not an alliance at all, strictly speaking. It is not even an economic union whose members are bound by some kind of obligations. And certainly it is not a military political bloc, which is NATO. BRICS does not even have its own charter, which means that in fact it's not even a formal organization, but just a platform for developing countries to communicate with each other. Therefore, we should not overstate the importance of this organization. But it should not be downplayed either. When the new country joins the BRICS on January 1st, it will account for 45% of global oil reserves, 47% of the world's population and 36% of the global economy. This is a really serious force, and the leaders of the BRICS countries constantly say that they are going to build a new world order and offer a different multipolar world. What are they proposing? Let's start with the obvious. Why does anyone need a new world order at all? Why are they not satisfied with the current one? Well, probably because the leaders of these countries, like me, like many other people, are convinced that we all really live in a unipolar world, which is basically ruled by one country. And no country can rival this country, no matter how much it wants to. At the same time, this very country in turn is the loudest in denying that the modern world is unipolar. But that's probably really been the case for the last 30 years. Therefore, why is a rhetorical question? Any large country dreams that this current world order will collapse and preferably the same unipolar world will reign, but with this very country at the head of it. Therefore, the emergence of such an organization as BRICS was obviously a matter of time. Let me remind you that its creation was announced in Russia during the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum with the participation of economic ministers of Brazil, Russia, India and China. And the first meeting of the then BRIC heads took place at the initiative of Vladimir Putin. Since then, the five countries have been working to reduce the dependence of their economies on Western-led financial institutions and to reduce the share of the dollar in mutual payments. As stated, relations between the BRICS countries are based on non-interference, equality and mutual benefit. Also among the declared objectives of the organization is to build a harmonious world full of prosperity. Sounds like a great goal, surely? Nevertheless, BRICS has always had a lot of skeptics, not only among ideological opponents from Western countries, but also among experts in Russia, for example. Many called BRICS just a photo opportunity for leaders and politicians, just another chance to make some headlines, or a decoration important for demonstrating the failure of attempts to isolate Russia on the world stage. They said that this is an artificial, futile and even harmful association of five completely different states. That 20 years ago, when the term was coined, these markets really did seem mega promising, but since then only China has managed to make a significant step forward. 
Another popular point of view in Russia was that our civilized Russia has no place in the company of undeveloped countries. We should only pull us back and even erode our European identity. That we should go in the other direction, to make concessions to the West and merge with the advanced civilization. One can agree or disagree with this. For example, personally, I have always considered Russia to be a mostly European country, first of all, in terms of a mentality of its inhabitants. And I do not believe in a special friendship between Russia and China. By the way, more about it in this video. But 15 years ago, when BRIC was first created, Russia probably did have a choice. To try to be accepted into the cool guys club of Europe and the United States, or to try to lead all the others as a second or third world power. Now it is already clear that we should not expect any rapprochement with the West in the next 20 years, and that Russia was not really able to lead anyone. Therefore, we need to work with what we have, and at the moment all we have is BRICS. Despite the fact that BRICS has already existed for 14 years, the surge of interest of the alliance occurred only in the post-Covid 2022-2023 period. And Russia, especially at this moment, is perhaps the most interested in the success of the organization and its development. Yes, I think no one in their right mind believes that it is Russia that is the leader of this alliance. If we believe in the postulates declared by all the members, then BRICS is a purely mutually beneficial economic thing, and absolute equality reigns within it. If we do not believe it and see it as a hidden challenge to the US, G7 and NATO, then it is still clearly not Russia's place to lead developing countries as an engine of economic growth. This position is firmly occupied by China. Nevertheless, China or Brazil already maintain excellent economic relations with the world, and they don't really need membership in any new organizations to keep doing so. China is the largest trading partner to more than 120 countries. They are already a major economic force to be reckoned with. They need BRICS more as a symbol, as a bid for the role of a world leader. Look, we have gathered developing countries around us, and we are ready to move on by ourselves, without the Western world. That the Global South is a force to be reckoned with. By the way, the phrase Global South has always made me confused when used in relation to the BRICS. I didn't know, but to label Russia as belonging to any South is quite unusual. But nevertheless, it is Russia that is now most interested in the development and expansion of BRICS. Because the other countries, except Iran perhaps, have a choice of who to trade with and move forward with. They can trade with all of them at once. But Russia cannot. All economic sanctions imposed on Russia are firmly tied to the existing world economic system and, of course, to the dollar. And they do work, although not as effectively as those who impose them would like. But if 36% of the world's GDP suddenly decides to abandon the dollar in payments among themselves, it's just great for Russia, an ideal situation. Yes, so far this goal is very, very far away, but what if? And even if this global goal fails, at least some connections will surely be established in the process. Any new channel for obtaining funds is a plus for Russia now. Russia obviously has nothing to lose by betting on the BRICS, because it simply does not have the opportunity to bet on anything else right now. One should not forget the political significance of this expansion for Russia. Yes, BRICS is an economic union and nothing more. But at a time when the UN votes show a rather dismal picture for Russia's leadership, when Western leaders in every speech talk about how Russia is completely isolated from the world community and is turning into a big northern North Korea, the admission of six more new countries into an organization firmly associated with Russia is a huge political victory. Iran? Our companions in misfortune. Argentina? Potentially a huge market if the country finally gets out of its perpetual economic turbulence. Ethiopia? A partially orthodox country. Our gateway to Africa. Yes, this does not mean that all these countries fully support Russia and are in total harmony with it. 
After all, we all know very well why Vladimir Putin delivered his speech in South Africa via video call, and why the New Development Bank, the official BRICS bank, stopped financing projects in Russia. But who stops the official Russian media from declaring, look, half of the world's population is with us, it is only 10-15% against us. What international isolation are you talking about? And this thesis works quite well for both internal and external audiences. Because there is some truth in it. For good or bad, most people in the non-Western world really don't care what Russia is doing on the other side of the world. Especially if they see their direct benefit in joining BRICS. Over the past two years, some 40 countries have expressed their desire to become part of the community. 23 of them have submitted formal applications to join, including the newest additions – Iran, Argentina, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, UAE and Egypt. Why are they doing this? Why apply to some obscure organization that doesn't even have a charter? and one of whose founding countries is considered extremely toxic for any relations at the moment. Simply because they believe that it is very profitable for them and does not carry any additional obligations. The search in business activity after the end of the pandemic, disruptions in global supply chains and later Russia's special military operation in Ukraine triggered a sharp rise in bank key interest rates around the world. The terms of Chinese loans are much more favorable than Western loans now. China has plenty of money and at the same time is interested in keeping its currency low enough compared to the dollar. For developing countries not burdened by any strong agreements with the West, the logic is simple. Why not? Countries interested in joining BRICS count on long and cheap loans, as well as other priorities in economic relations. If they can get, for example, a nuclear power plant at a discounted price on a 50-year loan and receive discounted raw materials, then, of course, it is a great deal, especially if in return you are required to give only vague, verbal expressions of friendship. Besides, let's be frank, none of the developing countries have particularly warm feelings for the United States and the existing world order. The hegemon is never loved, especially when the hegemon dictates how the rest of the world should live. Democracy and other values of the free world are great, but half of the world lives in countries with varying degrees of autocracy, or in rather dubious democracies. And the rulers and people of these countries obviously live in perpetual fear that one morning the hegemon will wake up and decide that these leaders have become closer to the bad Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi than to the good Milo Djukanovic or Paul Biya which means turning their country into a scorched desert with endless civil wars. Well, in the name of democracy, you know. Therefore, reducing its dependence on the rules of the Western world is a logical and generally quite smart move for almost any developing economy. Especially since there are now two countries that are under sanctions from head to toe among the BRICS members. And on the whole, none of the remaining nine countries is fully protected from exactly the same fate. Therefore, it is very useful to build relations among each other, to learn from the experience of protection from economic restrictions. Yes, of course, not everything is so bright and rosy. First of all, BRICS is not very formal. There are no obligations, no charters. BRICS is not supposed to have a common custom space, a common currency space or a common trade space. It is very convenient for entry, but even more convenient for exit. Everything can fall apart in an instant. Secondly, won't it turn out that joining BRICS is just a transition from one hegemon to another? China does not hide its leadership ambitions, and wouldn't this be a jump out of the frying pan into the fire? At least everyone kinda knows what to expect from the US. Finally, BRICS members now have, and always have had, countries with literally unresolved territorial claims. China and India have an ongoing border dispute, Ethiopia threatened to cut off water to Egypt a year ago, and Egypt threatened to send in troops. Are you sure this is a good atmosphere for unification? In response, one can only recall that, for example, Greece and Turkey were at war with each other in Cyprus, and did not prevent them from joining NATO. 
At the moment, the interests of the BRICS members coincide, although it is not certain that this will always be the case. For the time being, the leadership of all these countries and all their residents are quite positive towards BRICS. The entire Global South, and Russia with it, has an interest in returning international relations to their normal multipolar model that was in place for centuries prior to three decades ago. And this saw an opportunity to accelerate its return in the form of the BRICS. Whether it will work out, we will see. Thanks for watching. And as always, a huge shout out to my biggest supporters. Stakes It One, Hilizeta Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berze, Jordan Lamont, Jimmy Albin, Ellie, Petr Ilich, Hakushiro, and Bruce Eternik. I hope I've managed to pronounce it correctly. See you guys in two weeks.